everybody welcome to the first video that i am filming in the new horse corner horse room horse area can you tell that i haven't really figured out what i want to call it yet um so obviously this is my first time filming a youtube video in this space or really any video. I just got done filming an Instagram live. <laughs> so technically that was the first video that I'm filming in this space, but this is the first long format YouTube video that I'm filming in this space. So for those of you who are new or have not kept up with me on other socials, I am in my house. My husband and I bought a house at the end of July and we moved in at the end of August after some renovations and some painting and some projects. And it is now, at the time of filming, the end of October. So we've lived here for two months. And one of the projects that we worked on shortly after moving in was obviously the horse room corner. Um, all new shelving, all new setup. So the collection tour for 2024 is gonna be exciting. <laughs> But yeah, so welcome back. This is a little bit weird. Uh, normally I don't do a lot of longer format YouTube videos intermittently. Normally I just do my Briarfest videos and I do a collection tour. And then sometimes I do like bigger unboxings when Briar does their CCA events or if there was an exclusive club event like Ponies and Palm Trees, stuff like that. I don't do a lot of intermittent YouTube videos. But that's something I'm trying to be a little bit better about and trying to do a little bit more of. So, um, so today, and I can't believe I've never done this before because I probably should have, but today I am doing my first ever Q&A YouTube video. So I put out on my Instagram story um, an open-ended question box for my followers to ask questions that they wanted me to answer in this video. And Instagram is like by far where I have my biggest following. So I felt like that was the most appropriate place to share that where I was gonna get the best feedback. So these are the questions that you guys asked me. I have them all in my nifty little box here and I am going to answer them for you guys in this video. Um, I broke them up into a few different sections that I will kind of explain because there were broadly speaking a couple of different categories that you guys asked about and I'm going to try to do them in an order that kind of makes sense. This is going to be mostly a talking conversational video so if that's not your jam, see you in the next one. Have a fantastic evening. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look okay so i broke this up into one two three four <laughs> four sections um some are gonna be more like serious conversational and some are gonna be more fun so there's big picture personal questions model feature questions showing questions and general hobby questions. <laughs> so, I got a lot of feedback. Um, can you tell? <laughs> I had to break it up into separate categories. Okay, so we're gonna start with big picture personal questions so that you guys can get a little bit of background about myself, my collecting, etc. because I've never talked about that on YouTube before. I talk about it on Instagram all the time because Instagram is just different. Um, but I don't think I've ever talked about like my collection journey or origins on YouTube before. So that is what the first question is actually. How did you get into collecting? So I got into collecting kind of the reverse way of how most people get into it. Meaning that I came to the hobby because of real horses and not vice versa. I think a lot of people come to the hobby and then transition into real horses and riding. Mine was the opposite. So <laughs> I actually found out about the hobby through my barn. Uh, my barn used to, I still, well I wound up still riding at the same barn that I grew up riding at um, through you know 
years of riding for different trainers and doing whatever. But anyways, uh, my barn that I'm currently riding at was the one that I grew up riding at as a child. And when I was a child, they ran a tack shop out of the barn. They're, they're like two separate businesses, but one of the owners, one of the owner's family members ran a tack shop out of our barn. Like we had a massive observation room and they had literally a tack store set up in the observation room and they would get briars all the time. So every time I would come for my weekly riding lessons when I was like five years old, I would see yellow boxes and I would see the briars. And I would always pick out the ones I liked the best and I would never get any because riding real horses was expensive enough. And that's pretty valid on, you know, in my parents' defense. Um, and so I would ask for briars for Christmas and whatnot. Um, I think that maybe I was, I, I wanna say again, I was about six or seven, maybe five, when that started. And I kind of just collected sparingly throughout my childhood because you don't have a lot of funds available to you when you are nine years old and became more hobby aware as I got on social medias, Instagram predominantly, YouTube was like at its height when I was in middle school and just became much more aware of how big the hobby was and what Briar Fest was and what model horse showing was all through the internet. Um, but I didn't really have a chance to pursue it competitively or to the extent that I wanted to until I was older um, because I didn't have an income, because I was a child. <laughs> and my parents would buy me horses as gifts, but it was never something to where, you know, they would have ever wanted to be spending as much as I spend on it now, understandably, for a child. And also at the time, obviously, the main focus was the real horses, and, and still to this day, the main focus is the real horses. But I couldn't pursue a, a collection or what my parents considered to be toys at that age to such a degree. Um, the hobby is expensive and the hobby is always active. There's always something to be involved in or something to go to. And when you are not independent, there's not a great way to engage in it unless you know you have a parent or somebody who is independent that you can go with to these things. So as a first generation hobbyist youth, <laughs> it is hard to be super involved. Um, so I collected, I had a little collection, maybe like 10, 20 horses up until I was really in high school and beyond. Um, and then when I went into college, I kind of decided to dabble a little bit more. I would buy tractor supply specials and I would buy, I would go to my hobby store and buy like my favorite regular runs from the year. And I was aware of all the goings on and everything. I just wasn't participating. Um, I did not have the time in college to participate in the hobby. I was aware, I was aware of everything going on. I knew that I wanted to be a part of it eventually, but when I was in college, I was working almost full time. I was going to school full time. I was in the honors college. I was in the three honors groups. I was the president and founding member of my university's equestrian team. And so I was traveling every other weekend with them. I was also showing my own horse year round. So we would go to WEC in the winters and then I would show on the national circuit in the summers and springs and falls. So I was, I was doing it all. I was doing everything. So I was hobby aware and I was involved to a certain degree, um, but I was not pursuing it the way that I pursue it now or the way that I've been pursuing it the last couple of years. That kind of changed when I went to law school and that's when I decided to be all in. I wanted to go to Briarfest 2020. That was the year I started law school in fall of 2019. I was all in, I was in all of the clubs. I wanted to, you know, go full steam ahead with my social medias, start my YouTube, everything. I wanted 100% in, I wanted to start live showing. Um, and so I got all of that prepped and ready and I was so excited. And then COVID hit 
and I was able to still pursue the hobby and grow my collection abundantly during that time. And I was still able to interact and grow my social medias at that time and my online presence. But obviously, <laughs> not a good time to start going to Briarfest and not a good time to start live showing. So those two elements kind of remained outside of my grasp for a while. And uh, then I got engaged. And so I decided, okay, Briarfest and the live showing, the in-person things, those are gonna have to wait until after I get married and after I take the bar exam and graduate from law school. So I did everything virtually. Everything was remote. My collecting, uh, all of my hobby interactions were done from really my home until fall of 2022. Um, I took the bar exam in July of 2022, passed the first time, thank God, um, got married in August of 2022, came home from our honeymoon and started live showing in September of 2022. I have not looked back. Uh, I went to my first Briarfest in person in July of this year, so 2023. And I don't plan on slowing down anytime soon. <laughs> so now not only do I have the collection and the social media, but I'm doing all of the things in person as well. So it was a process. It was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of waiting and wanting to be involved in something that I just had to wait for because of where I was at in life. And I am thankful for that journey and every step of the way because I learned so much from the experiences that I had when I wasn't live showing once a month and wasn't spending a week or a week and a half in Kentucky in the summers. Um, and like I had said before, real horses and riding will always be my priority. My horse will always be my priority. So when those things need to take priority, they need to take priority. But when they don't, the hobby is a great pastime. But that kind of gets us to where we are at today. Um, obviously, I collect almost exclusively OF Briar. We'll get into some of that a little bit later. Um, I love sharing my collection and my hobby activity on social media, predominantly on Instagram and TikTok. Obviously, I have YouTube too. Um, I also have my hobby business, which I will mention here because it doesn't really come up later on. But in hmm, beginning of 2022, so almost two years ago, um, I started hosting a photo show series, um, CWS, Collecting with Sam, Model Horse Shows. And in January of this year, 2023, I officially opened my LLC. Uh, so I have a business, uh, Michigan LLC. CWS Model Horse Shows and Designs, LLC. How many times can you say LLC before it becomes absolutely meaningless? Because I think I've hit whatever that barrier is. And essentially, I run a photo show series that hosts monthly shows. Um, I ship physical prizes to everybody who wins prizes in my shows. Typically, I have between 50 to 75 entrants every month. Um, I advertise exclusively on social media, Facebook and Instagram. Um, those are my primary sites. I have pages on both of the sites. If you type in CWS Model Horse Shows, I will come up. Um, the designs element of it is actually came from me learning from my customers and clients, um, things that they needed help with. So folks didn't really understand how to make reference cards or didn't have a good way to make reference cards or they wanted somebody to give them feedback on their photography, or they needed a way to keep track of all of their placings um, from shows or to catalog their collections, so on and so on and so on. So the designs element of the business is actually an Etsy shop that sells predominantly downloadable resources for model horse showing and collecting. Um, so I sell templates downloadable instructional templates on how to make both halter and collectability reference cards. Um, I sell downloadable catalogs, pre-formatted spreadsheet catalogs to help you keep track of your collection for valuation and insurance purposes. 
um, as well as a showing specific catalog that will help you keep track of your placings, NAN qualifications, etc. Um, from showing. Oh gosh, what else do I do? I offer photo critiques where I will give you a personalized multi-page report uh, based on photos that you have sent me. Um, generally that's going to be like photo showing photos, so we'll talk about lighting and angles and backgrounds and stuff like that. I also have uh, a judge shadowing program for photo show judging that I have uh, both pre-recorded and the option for live materials uh, for that. And, and then I also make these super fun signs that have absolutely nothing to do with model work showing or downloadable resources or learning or education of any kind. They're just fun. So I have those <laughs> and I sell them, I ship those through the Etsy shop. And then I also sell them at live shows when I go to live shows. So they're just fun and I wanted to make some for myself. And then I was like, oh my gosh, other people would actually love these too. So I sell them. I also use them as a nice donation piece. Um, if I ever go to a live show that's being hosted as a like not-for-profit situation and the donations are going to a good cause or an organization, I'll donate some of those. Um, I use them in giveaways. They're just a great little fun knickknack. And I do sell them too, so check them out, I suppose. Um, but that's where we're at. So at this point in my collecting, I'm an OF Briar collector, live shower, photo show host, um, business owner, I guess. Um, and I've also judged a couple of live shows and I have enjoyed learning more about uh, live show judging as it is a lot different and fast paced, more fast paced than photo show judging. Um, I've judged a couple of live shows. I'm judging another one again next month. And so I'm also learning in that capacity. Hopefully that is the longest answer I have to give you on any of these questions. So. I'm gonna stop talking and we're gonna move on to the next one. Okay, so this one is kind of a follow-up, um, but I'll get into the answer a little bit more. Uh, what came first, models or real horses? So obviously at the beginning of my very long-winded answer to the last question, um, I had said that real horses came first, and that is true. Um, I started riding when I was five or six. Um, I grew up riding hunter jumpers, so, so my base really comes from equitation. Uh, the equitation ring and I did that until I was mm, freshman in high school and then I had a couple rebellious years where I decided that I wanted to event because I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie or at least I was when I was in high school I think that part of my personality is slowly dying but I loved cross-country and I loved like hunter paces and fox hunting so I did that and got a very, very good foundation in dressage that I am eternally grateful for throughout high school and a little bit of college. And then through riding um, and being judged on an equitation-based criteria when I was riding for my college, I kind of fell back in love with equitation and that discipline and so eventually wound up back doing the hunters and the equitation, which is where I am right now. Um, but again, I'm eternally grateful for that dressage foundation that I built when I was still young, um, because it's definitely something that I think that everybody benefits from. And I know that it's made me the equitation rider I am today, because when it comes to technical riding and uh, being very precise and wanting things to happen right now, uh, that's dressage. So <laughs> a lot of the successes that I had with my horse and the equitation, adult equitation, definitely uh, came from my dressage background. Um, so anyways, uh, I actually just retired my longtime show partner, Mr. Smoochie. Um, most of you guys know about Smooch. I'll throw a picture of him up here, maybe a few. Um, he had a very traumatic injury in the spring of this year. And he's 20 years old, he's going to be 21 in March, and so once we rehabbed him from that injury, I decided to just permanently retire him um, and let him be a muddy pasture monster 
instead of trying to bring him back into work from a very traumatic injury at age 21. I just didn't think that was fair. So he is completely retired and I'm currently on the hunt for my next partner. Um, Smooch will always be with me and under my care. He actually lives only about 15 minutes away and I go out and give him carrots all the time, which is fun. Um, and now I am on the hunt, casually on the hunt for my next partner. Um, a lot of things up in the air right now with regard to that, but I'm hoping that maybe by the spring um, I will be back horse showing again. So we'll see. Okay, next, how do you balance all aspects of your life, work, hobby, real horses, uh, etc.? Which is a great question. Uh, I wear quite a few hats in my life. I'm obviously involved in the hobby. I have real horses um, and I'm also an attorney. I'm a trademark and copyright attorney, which is very interesting being in the hobby with all of the intellectual property uh, issues that come up in the hobby. That's a different video though. Um, and so, I mean, this question is just asking about how I balance all of that. And balance is something, time management is something that has literally gotten me to this Point in my life. I mean, I pretty much just gave you guys my life story and there's always been numerous big time vacuums that I have to balance between work and horses and school. Thank goodness school is off the radar for now, but um, I have, I, when I was in college, I was managing my schedule literally down to the hour every single day of the week, seven days a week. So I've got a little bit more flexibility now. Thank God that school is over. Um, but I would say my biggest advice and, and the advice I give myself and what I have to do to balance all of those things is to just use your time wisely and prioritize. So use your time wisely manage your time because if you don't it'll get away from you <laughs> so make sure that you block out time for specific things and that you actually do those things in the time that you blocked out um, that's huge and then more importantly make sure you have your priorities right um, like i had said earlier uh, for just as an example my real horses, my real animals, and my relationships with human beings will always come before these plastic horses. Like there's no world in which I would ever prioritize plastic horses over my horse, or my husband, or my family, um, because they're plastic horses. And they're great, but they are not your career, or your education, or the animals that are under your care, the animals that you are stewards of, the animals that you have chosen to take under your roof and under your care. And they're not your life partner, and they're not your best friend or your sister. And so I think just having a very clear understanding of what your priorities are before you commit to things, dedicate an abundant amount of effort, whether that's financial or time or whatever, to something, um, make sure that you've got your priorities right and that you're still prioritizing the most important things. Um, and then from there, just time management and making sure that you set aside time to get the important things done before you spend time on fun things like plastic horses. Okay, I think I've talked enough about serious things. Now it's time for some fun things. Okay. <laughs> Um, a lot of these are going to be me putting like little images on the screen because I don't have a lot of these things in front of me or available to me. So next question, we're moving into part two, which is model feature or featuring questions. So questions about like specific models. Okay, and starting off with like the most difficult one, of course, my top five grails. I got this question probably five or six times in a bunch of different formats. People just wanted to know like what my top whatever grails were. The number five came up the most, so I picked the number five. And I think with all of these like top whatever or favorite type questions, I am excluding anything that is one of a kind that has either been created or could be created. 
because because of course right because of course so those are off the table not including those so my top five grails of all time I think my top two would have to be the most elusive newsworthies that exist which would be again besides one of a kind jump for joy and Toulouse um, I will probably never own those horses I would love to I would spend a stupid amount of money to own either one of them they are the only two besides glossy blue and glossy mr. chips they are the only two that I do not have in my conga so maybe someday <laughs> um, so those are my top two grails because newsworthy uh, my next one would be music row who is the only it's just a dream that I do not have um, and I love her color so much I don't care that she's impractical I just love her she is a nostalgic childhood mold for me and so a music row would just it would make my heart very happy but there are literally only eight of them that exist so I do not think that that will ever happen uh, next would be Hollywood Boulevard this one is like the only one on this list that's mildly obtainable I think um, Hollywood Boulevard is a Salonero he was an event model and I definitely think that I will add him someday um, he's his run count is higher than the rest of these but he is one of the only he's probably the only realistically obtainable Salonero that I don't have um, I think that the rest of them are just kind of beyond what I will be able to collect because they just never come up for sale um, by the way most of my Salineros are packed away this is not all of them these are the ones that are not an active part of my like live show string <laughs> so all of my nice ones are packed away ready for a live show so that is that's why there's gaps here um, oh, and then my fifth slot was actually a tie between Sinza and North Star so Sinza is the raffle Vallegro and North Star is the raffle Duende so these are all very unobtainable horses um, maybe someday some of them will be obtainable in some capacity but most of them the run counts are just so small that I don't know if I will ever actually be able to add them or not but those are my top five grails as of this moment okay top five molds my favorite molds um, I'm just gonna throw these on the screen too instead of trying to pull horses down because it's molds not models um, one obvious newsworthy hence the last <laughs> the grail question uh, newsworthy that stupid little hunter pony he has a chokehold on me second is gonna be Dundee I love I love a good Dundee he's so lovely he's just soft and dynamic and the colors that they've done on him are so nice um, I really really like Dundee so newsworthy Dundee third probably Salonero I've always had a soft spot for Salonero uh, I love his like just slightly Roman nose it's it makes him so diverse um, I just really like him and they've done some really nice colors on him too uh, fourth probably Totalus I do love Totalus he's a bit more small and compact than Salonero um, and I appreciate Salonero's softness and his detail uh, despite his size so I do have him above Totalus but Totalus is right under Salonero for me I really like Totalus and then lastly I said Shannondell I, I feel like my fifth place slot could have gone a couple different ways but I love a good Shannondell such a nice mold by far my favorite draft mold that Briar has done okay so next I'm, I modified this question just a little bit the question was your top five Briar releases and I felt like top five Briar releases compared to my top five grails they're probably going to be like the same or similar so I changed this one a little bit to interpret it as like your top five types of model that Briar releases um, so I guess to just give a good example of that I'll give my first answer which is that I love the classic gambler's choice for the collector club I love that type of run um, I almost always wind up wanting them 
all of them. <laughs> all the realistic ones at least. Um, and similarly, I really like the Vintage Club models that are the old mold or like vintage mold modern color. Hello, Shark Tail. Beep. Um, like Cooper. Cooper is a great example of that. Um, he's one of my favorite models. I actually mention him later in this. <laughs> But he's so cute, and so I really like that type as well, that run type. Um, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a good single day stable mate. I know they've started calling those like the event stable mates, but I love the single day stable mates. I have so many of them, and I love, they're just, they're always so detailed and like glossy and so nice. Um, obviously, I love the Briarfest exclusive event models. That's like, that's my weakness. That is the dagger in my heart. Um, they're so cool and the, the colors are always beautiful and detailed and they're like just collectible enough to where they're, they're still super rare, but they're not gonna completely bankrupt you all the time. It's like that sweet spot. Um, so I've got a ton of those. My bolo is all the way up there. He's like the only one that I don't have packed away for my show this weekend. Um, but yes, I love, I love a good event model. And then my last one that I threw in here was the Stablemate Club Gambler's Choice. So I love the Gambler's Choices. I'm a sucker for a good Gambler's Choice too. Um, the Stablemate Club Gambler's Choice, they typically pick a popular Stablemates mold and then they slap a bunch of colors on it. They typically gloss one or all of them and they're just so much fun. Okay, next, controversial. What is a mold you would never collect? I'm gonna just stick to modern molds because there's a lot of vintage molds. I'm really sorry, my vintage people. There's a lot of vintage molds that I just wouldn't pick up collecting right now in the year of our God in 2023. Um, unless I had some sort of a sentimental connection to them, like Misty, I have a Misty Conga. Um, and so I'm gonna, for the sake of realism, realism I'm gonna stick to more modern molds. And um, a modern mold that I would never collect is Forever Sage. Um, I, I don't really feel like I have to explain myself there, I just, I don't know what she's doing um, or what she is supposed to be or what I just don't, I don't really understand her. And that's okay, some people love her and I'm happy that she is loved, but I would never collect her. Okay, next, I actually grabbed horses for this one. <laughs> um, my most sentimental model. So I actually still have my first my first briars, which were the classic spirit set. Now this is a family set, so he's just one. I also still have the mare in the foal. He's obviously been loved. He is missing an ear and has like an entire hip that has no paint on it. Um, but here he is in all of his glory. The, this was my first briar. The family set was my first, they were my first briars. Um, so obviously they are my most sentimental. I sold, I didn't have a big carpet herd as a kid, but I sold the rest of the classics that I had as a kid um, and I kept these guys because they were my first. So as crusty and broken as they are, I still keep them because sentiment. And then similarly, I'm a little bit more gentle with these, but this family, this was an Arabian family set from a very long time ago. Um, these belonged to my mom and my sister when they were girls. And my grandpa kept them in his basement when I was a child um, for me to play with whenever I came over. So they originally belonged to my mom and my aunt and then lived at my grandpa's house for my entire childhood. Um, I was their only grandchild for 13 years so I literally had like a little toy closet in the basement um, and so he would keep these horses there for me. And when he passed away, they were one of the only things that I knew that I had to take from the house. 
Um, so I have the whole, again, have the whole family of three set for the horses that belonged to my family. And then I have the whole family of three set for my first ever set of briars. Um, and I think it's kind of cool that both of these sentimental pieces came from three-piece family classic sets. Like, what are the odds of that? So anyways, here they are, the, the representatives at least from those little family sets. What is your favorite model in your collection? Um, it depends on the day of the week, honestly. I've got, <laughs> I've got a couple of favorites. Um, right now, I feel like my favorite has to be my Duwamish, who I just purchased about a month ago. Um, because I've wanted one for so long and he's so lovely and he has been to one show and has already double nanned and he's just everything. <laughs> he was probably like the top event model that was on my ISO. Um, and I finally, finally, finally snatched one for a price that I was like, I can mostly sleep at night thinking about the price I paid for him. So I'm happy to have him. I feel like right now he's gotta be, he's gotta be up there, maybe tied with the one that I have uh, kind of put out as being my favorite, which is my Golden Sunset. Um, I, I don't know if Duwamish tops Golden Sunset for me. Uh, give me, give me some time. I've got to come to terms with that. But for a long time, it was my golden sunset. So, mm, one of those two probably um, has, has the top seat right now. But, I mean, again, like, ask me next week. I don't really know. Top three most unique models in your collection. Well, the one that I have to include as an answer to this question is my Ambrose. Um, and if you don't know the story surrounding my Ambrose, he is not just a really cool web special, unique one-off run that Briar did. He is also one of two, one of only two known variations to be produced with a white mane and not the gray mane. Um, so that makes him very unique. It has definitely helped him out in collectability before. Um, and he's been featured on uh, Milo Pierce's blog and a couple of different social media sites and whatever. So he's got to take, I think, take the cake for uniqueness at least. Other than that, I don't really have anything that's exceptionally unique in, in ways that aren't just run count or like run type. Um, I would probably have to throw some of my event models into the mix at that point if I had to pick more beyond white maned Ambrose. Um, so for example, just so I don't do a repeat of Duwamish, I said, you know, good examples would be Burnham. Hi. Thank you for coming. You want to join? Um, Burnham or El Capitan. Those are two of my more rare, difficult to find event models. So I would say that that makes them pretty unique. Um, do I own any brand other than Briar? Yes. I have one stone. <laughs> This is a portrait model back when they used to do portrait models. Um, I got a portrait model done of my horse, Smooch, that I talked about earlier. Um, so this is my portrait model of Smooch. Looks a lot like him. You know, obviously picked this color and this mold. This is a seal bay. This is a seal bay and I will die on that hill, people. This is a seal bay. Um, <laughs> I won't go down that rabbit hole, but this is what a seal bay looks like. Um, this is, yeah, portrait model of Smooch. This is my only stone, probably will always be my only stone. I'm an OF Briar girly through and through. It's just what I like, it's what I've always liked. Um, and I also have a traditional scale Beswick um, that my husband bought for me the day that he proposed. 
Um, so that has a lot of sentimental value and will always be a part of my collection. I'm not gonna touch it or bring it off the shelf because it's very breakable, but it's been featured on my Instagram plenty of times and in every single collection tour that I've ever done. So it's out there. Um, and I also have eh, maybe eight to 10 smaller, more stable mate scale Hagen Renickers. Um, they sometimes get dragged to shows with me, depends on what the class offerings are and what's gonna be there. But I do have those, um, and those will also probably always stay in my collection just because they're fun pieces and I like, and, and I appreciate the you know, heritage that HR brought to the hobby and to Briar. So I like having those. Um, I've got my one Beswick and then I've got Smooch, my one stone. Okay, okay. So <laughs> this question, I thought this was so creative. Least favorite horse out of your favorite conga. Okay, so my favorite conga is Newsworthy. We have established this. So my, <laughs> my least favorite horse is out of my Newsworthy conga. There are two, one, Mr. Chips, I'm so sorry, <laughs> and two is Cupcake. So Cupcake is my least favorite Newsworthy. Mr. Chips is my second least favorite Newsworthy. <laughs> and I say it in that order because my husband bought me Mr. Chips before he was my husband. Uh, before he was even my fiance, he bought me Mr. Chips. So he has sentimental value. So he cannot be my least favorite. But my least favorite, so my least favorite then has to be Cupcake. Um, and I, there's two reasons. One is that I don't like vintage colors. Um, I'm a kind of ABCs collector and obviously these colors are not realistic. <laughs> so I'm not a big vintage color collector, especially on more modern molds like Newsworthy. Um, I say modern, I know that he's getting up there, but um, it's just not my jam. Like I would never, unless I was showing like a vintage club specific collectability class, I'm never gonna show either one of these models. Um, and I'm, I just don't love bringing back vintage colors on modern molds, it's not my jam. I lo love the opposite, love the realistic colors on the vintage molds, but just don't love the vintage colors on the more modern molds. So that's why these two are my least favorite of the Newsworthy Conga. Um, and also, I was a little bit misled by the person that I purchased him from as to his condition. It's hard to tell in pictures what the condition of gloss might be, um, but I was led to believe that he was in a lot better quality than he actually is. It doesn't really matter because he's a shelf sitter but that still kind of puts a sour taste in your mouth sometimes. So I think that that contributes to him being the least favorite newsworthy that I have. Okay, yes. So now we're on to section three, which are questions that were specifically about model horse showing. First we have, which model is your best shower? So this is a hard question for me to answer because one, I have only been live showing for a little over a year. I've been photo showing for you know four or so years, only live showing a little bit over a year. And obviously I'm gonna kind of pull my data from the live shows I've been to. And that's hard because for the first year that I showed, my strategy was to get as many horses qualified for NAN as possible. Um, in case that they did a 2023 NAN, because I like my dream is to show at a NAN. Um, and they did not do a 2023 NAN, but by <laughs> July of 2023, I had like over 150 horses qualified for NAN. I have NAN cards, like different horses. Um, and so my strategy going into all those shows was to kind of bring different stuff to every show. So as soon as a horse qualified or won or did well, I would throw it back up on my shelf and I would bring something new to the next show. And that was the strategy I took for the first year that I live showed. Um, only recently have I kind of said, I've already got more horses qualified than I'll be able to show in 2024 at NAN anyways. 
So I'm just showing whatever the heck I like now. <laughs> My strategies have changed a little bit. Um, so it's hard to say because I don't repeat, I haven't repeated a lot of my really successful courses. Um, but I will say the two, I'll say three that I've noticed that have done well, um, and that I have brought to a couple of different shows for whatever reason are my Cooper, told you he'd come up again. Cooper has won every single class that I have shown him in and he's gotten a few sectional champions. Um, same as my Mamacita, who is on the Andalusian Mare Mold. She was a Briarfest special run of all things. Um, the only class she did not win was at the Briarfest Open Show, <laughs> and she still got a ribbon. So um, she does very, very well. She's also, again, excluding the Briarfest Open Show. I think she's gotten a sectional champ at every show that I've taken her to, so she's been very successful. And then my Dag Dia has also been very successful. Um, I think he's won, he's either won or gotten second in every class I've shown him in. So I would say those three are the top ones that I have just based on the data that I can use. But uh, that's mostly because my horses that win or go on to like win sectionals and overalls, and whatever, I haven't shown them after that first time they were really successful. So I'll be able to better answer that question in like the spring after I do a year of showing whatever the heck I feel like showing. So that's uh, my long-winded answer to that one. Um, Briarfest Live tips and tricks question mark. Well, that's a big question. Um, and in the spirit of full transparency, I've only done the Briarfest open show in person, live show, one time. I did the photo show during COVID every year that they offered it. And then 2023 was my first time doing the live open show. Um, and it went well. I got ribbons and didn't miss any classes and got everything set up and torn down successfully and I had a good day. Um, I think that my advice to somebody wanting to do the open show for the first time would be to not do the open show as your first show. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, so many people do that. So many people do that and I feel like if you do it that way, you are just setting yourself up for disappointment and failure. And I know that sounds harsh, but it is true because the Briarfest Open Show is like any other live show on steroids. And if you go even just to a few smaller live shows, you're gonna understand what the heck is going on, how fast paced it is, what is expected of you, it is much less costly to make mistakes at a smaller, local, I say local, you know, regional live show than it is to make mistakes at Briarfest Live. And it's easier to fix mistakes and there's more flexibility to fix mistakes at a regional show than there is at the Briarfest Open Show. So my big advice would be don't make the Briarfest Open Show your first live show. Just save yourself the heartache and the disappointment and the chaos and the stress and go, go to a couple of regional shows, even if you have to travel and spend the night somewhere. That's what I have to do when I go to 90% of the live shows that I go to. It's worth the investment in a weekend, at least one weekend, if not more than that, to get some experience under your belt before you commit to Kentucky. Um, besides that, I would say do your research and be organized, know what the heck is going on, have your documentation prepared, have all of your models tagged going into it. Just know, like be organized and know what's going on. Stay efficient, stay on top of things, know what rings are running what. If you can, if you can pull up where they have the live feed of the projection screen that has all of the classes. That was super helpful for me. 
because we were in a spot of the room where you couldn't see the screen, so you'd have to like walk to the other side of the hall, which is a big hall, to even know what classes were running. So if you need, like, if you can, join, if they do the Zoom call again, join the Zoom call so you can see the little live screen of what classes are being hosted. Um, just, yeah, do your research and be organized. Understand, have read through the show packet. It's a long show packet, but you should read it. Um, and be nice to people. Just be nice to people. Be polite. If you have a question, ask questions, but like be respectful of judges and stewards' time. And um, I mean, that's like general showing advice. I don't know if that needs to be said that that's Briarfest specific or not. Um, and then this one is Briarfest specific, I guess. I would go in with no expectations other than to like enjoy yourself and see pretty horses and enjoy the experience. Um, the judging, there's, the classes are so big that the judging can seem kind of unpredictable and all over the place. And that's just due to the nature of the show. It's a massive show when there's 200 horses in one class, it might seem a little bit unpredictable. Um, and that's just the way that it is because it's so big. So I would go in with no expectations, don't go in thinking that you're gonna win anything and you'll have a much better experience than expecting to win something and then coming out maybe being dis disappointed in how you did. So go to other shows first, <laughs> that's the big one. Do your research and stay organized, be nice to people and don't have expectations. Just go do your best and have a good time. Um, okay, the next one was very open-ended. It was just photography tips. And I don't know if that was directed towards photo showing or just in general, but I came up with a couple of pointers that I think could go both ways. Uh, one, <laughs> one was um, invest in a good camera. Um, our iPhones can do a lot nowadays. Um, and I think especially if you're just looking for social media posting, I think your phone is sufficient, especially like these newer phones. The camera on this phone is ridiculous. Um, so I feel like if, if you're just looking to be active on social media and share nice pictures and videos, your phone is fine. Um, if you really want to up your game though, especially when it comes to photo showing, I would say invest in a good camera. Um, if you think that photo showing is something that you want to do regularly, it behooves you to have a camera that can capture your models very well. Um, there's a lot of different ways that that can go, but that would be my advice. I love my camera, I wouldn't trade it for the world, and it was well worth the investment that I made um, in purchasing it. Uh, second, kind of similarly, would be to invest in a light box. Those are a lot less expensive than cameras. Um, so if you can't invest in a camera, I would say at least invest in a light box. Um, if you don't have access to very, very good natural lighting at any hour of the day, um, a light box can be your best friend. Even if you're just trying to take studio pictures, um, not necessarily like competitive pictures, but studio pictures, a light box will help you immensely. Um, yeah, and I think, again, again, if you can't invest in a camera, um, a light box is a much more cost-effective alternative. Even if you're using a phone in a light box, that could help you a lot versus just using a phone against, say, drywall or something. Um, okay, besides that, just like go out in nature with your camera. You know, like I, I get a lot of comments about like, oh, the angle of your picture is so creative and so cool and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, that's because when I was a kid, I would just go out and like take pictures of plants and things and experiment. And it is kind of muscle memory. I know exactly kind of what I want my pictures to look like. Like I can, I see something with my eye and just eventually will know how to make the camera capture that. Um, so just try, I guess, put, you know, go out in nature and take some pictures. Doesn't have to be model horses, but spend time just experimenting and find your style. And then that'll translate over into the hobby in whatever capacity you want it to. Okay, general hobby questions. Last section. Okay, <laughs> I think I'm going to rearrange these because some of them are a little bit heavier and some of them are a little bit more lighthearted. So let's do the lighthearted ones first. 
Um, <laughs> how many models do you purchase a year? Blech. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. A lot. Um, it depends on the year. I will, I'm almost always in plan to always be involved in the Briar Clubs. So I stay pretty up on all of the new releases and the new molds that Briar's coming out with. You know, at least the ones that I like and that I don't wind up selling because I don't really want to collect them. Um, that probably looks like at least 15 to 20 horses a year, just keeping up with the clubs. Um, across Vintage Club, Stablemates Club, Premier Club, and the Collector's Club, all the Gambler's Choice horses, all of the varied runs and releases and what have you. So I would say that that aspect of my hobby probably grows by at least 15 to 20 horses a year. And that's why I say it kind of depends on the year because with the new releases that you're obligated to purchase in some capacity at least, you're not always guaranteed to like everything. So <laughs> it kind of depends on how much I like what Briar puts out in a given year. Um, as far as other purchases, I would say probably close to the same. It's probably gonna be about oh, 20 to 30 new secondhand purchases every year. Um, I know at Briarfest this year, I think I bought 20 horses, and that was including the special runs um, that were new, but that maybe included like 15 horses or so that were secondhand, and, and then there's other purchases throughout the year too. So I would say anywhere between 20 to 30 secondhand horses and maybe 15 to 20 club horses. Um, and it could, it could be less than that. I think that that's probably like the high end of things. Something that I predict kind of going forward from this point in my collecting on is that that number is going to decrease. The number of secondhand horses that I purchase every year is going to decrease. Uh, just because I have kind of a really strong base collection of things that I like and the things that I like that I don't have, I don't have them for a reason. And that reason is because they're either very expensive, very rare, or more often than not, bold. Um, <laughs> so now that I've kind of developed a really strong base collection of horses that I like, I have a feeling that the additions are going to be more expensive and less frequent. Um, hence my more recent affinity with the event models can't buy 20 of those a year. I would, my husband might kill me if I did that. So, uh, I would say that those numbers are accurate as of now, but in the future I definitely see that number going down and the additions being more valuable type horses. Okay, uh, future Briarfest themes question mark. Um, so themes that I would like to see Briar use. Um, that's a hard one for me because I think that Briar does such a good job coming up with themes themselves that I would never think of. <laughs> um, I would love them to do, and I've always thought this, I would love them to do a theme like the denim and diamonds theme where they focused on the Western disciplines but for the English disciplines. Um, so I would love for them to do like a, the year of the sport horses or something like that where they focus on English disciplines and maybe go into like some of the heritage of the English disciplines like uh, eventing was, cross country was derived from training war horses to jump over ditches in World War One and earlier, which is really cool and nobody talks about it. And that would be a really cool educational thing that Briar could include in a theme like that. Um, just like, you know, the origins of fox hunting, which is the origins of the hunter discipline. Um, and they, nobody talks about that either. And it's really cool. And it goes back to England and, you know, clerks and lords and cool things like that. So I feel like there's a, 
kind of some buried nuggets in in the history of the English disciplines and also like so many cool sport horses that they could feature um, and a, a variety of different colors and breeds and I think that that would be really cool. I also would love any kind of mythology themed Briarfest. I don't really know how they would handle that because they have done the Greek gods and goddesses series, the web special series, so it would have to be obviously different from that, um, but I would like some sort of a mythology Briarfest. I think that that would be really cool. Maybe if they did like a horse from each different type of mythology, like Greek, Roman, Celtic, stuff like that. Um, that could be cool. I love like the fantasy theme, just the generic fantasy theme, but I feel like they've exhausted that. <laughs> and they did a whole year with Celtic Fling. They did like a whole year that was Celtic, you know, mythology and otherwise. So that one might be a little bit saturated at this point, but I think it's always a classic to go back to in some capacity. Um, <laughs> this one made me laugh. Would husband Sam ever try customizing? So for those of you who don't know, my husband's name is also Sam. And so when I talk about him on any of my social medias or to any of my hobby friends, I have to call him husband Sam because if I don't, people think that I'm talking in the third person and then they think that I'm insane, which is debatable, but most of the time in that context, I'm just talking about my husband. So, um, and what a lot of people also don't know about husband Sam, he's also a man of many hats. Um, he's an artist and he went to art school um, and he's very good at painting and he is actually my repair artist. And so he does a lot of my very basic model repairs but no, I don't think he would ever try to actually customize a model horse um, for a couple of different reasons. One, I don't collect customs, so even if I asked him to do it for me, I wouldn't because that's not really what I collect. If I asked him to, he would, but I just wouldn't ask him to <laughs> because I, I love the collectability aspect of original finish and I love Briar and so that's that's kind of my jam. So. Would he if I asked him? I'm sure. Would I ask him? No. And would he do it of his own volition? No. Um, but it might be funny to see him do like a stable mates contest, painting contest one time just to see how he'd do. If I ever drag him to Briarfest or Briar West with me, I will make him do that. How This one's funny too. How much time do you spend in your hobby room? Um, and my grand answer to that is not as much as I would like. I would like to be down here 24 seven, like all the time. I would never leave this room if I had the choice. Um, I do spend a chunk of time down here, primarily because now with this new setup, my desk is actually like right behind where you guys are at. And like I talked about before, I have a small business, a hobby business that I run, and I run it from that desk. So whenever I am working on stuff, for my business, I am down here and I'm with the horses and I'm in the hobby corner room, what have you. Um, that did not used to be the case at the loft when we lived at the loft. Um, and that was my dream when we moved. I told my husband, I was like, I wanna I want be able to see my horses from my desk because I wanna be able to keep my collection and like the hobby in sight while I'm working for my business as a source of inspiration and just like keeping me grounded. And it's amazing and I love it. I love having my desk like right next to my collection. Um, but because of that, now I spend a lot of time down here running my business in front of my collection. Um, when we were at the loft, I would say like on average less than two hours a week. Uh, which was a bummer. So that's one thing that I wanted to change when we moved and it did and it's magical. So <laughs> second to last question. Uh, this one is heavier, more serious. Uh, what is one thing you love about the hobby and what is one thing you would change? One thing that I love about the hobby, they're actually kind of polar opposites of each other. So it's interesting. Uh, the thing I love about the hobby the most is that it is a group of people with a shared interest that are generally 
really, really, really cool and fun and generous and creative and kind. And I have so, I've grown so many incredible friendships from the hobby. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's true. And it's such a special like niche interest. And to share that with a group of people is so much fun. And to just be able to have these completely incomprehensible conversations about these plastic horses. It literally sounds like we're talking another language when we talk about these plastic horses. But we know so much about them and there's so much to know about them. And to be able to share that with other people is so, it's so cool. And there's so much creativity and knowledge and what have you in the hobby that it's just so cool. Um, and like the more events you attend and the more people you get to know and the more you can just learn and latch on to those connections and those people and, and that understand. It's just so cool. It's so cool. So I guess the shared interest and the people um, is my favorite thing about the hobby. And then one thing that I would change about the hobby who is broad and broadly speaking, it is entitlement. Um, there's a lot of entitlement in the model horse hobby. And I think that a lot of that comes off through the internet and not as much, it does still come off, but not as much in person as it does. I think the internet kind of fosters the entitlement a little bit, which is unfortunate. And I don't think that's exclusive to the hobby. I think that that's just kind of the way that it is. Um, but I guess more specifically, what I, what I would change is, um, kind of entitlement in two different areas. One, entitlement in the, mm, accessibility is the wrong word, but, but a little bit in the accessibility of specific parts of the hobby. Um, because the hobby as a whole has come a long way in terms of being accessible. There are parts of the hobby that are accessible to people that maybe a decade ago would have had absolutely no access to the hobby you know, with the addition of the collectas and certain live shows having divisions for collecta and schleich and, you know, that that sort of more financial accessibility as well as elements of Briarfest being more accessible and, and whatnot, but, but more so in the release of models and the type of models that are available. Um, having that be more accessible to more folks is great, um, but also, we have to remember that Briar and other model horse producers are companies and they do not actually owe us anything. So they don't owe us web specials. They don't owe us specific price points. They don't owe us raffle models. They don't owe us anything. And there's a lot of complaining to the tune of I never get this or I never get that. And that might be the case and it's okay to be disappointed about that. But I think we, at the end of the day, we have to remember that Briar literally does not owe us anything unless we have paid them for something. They are a company and they don't owe us anything just because we like their stuff and we like plastic horses. So um, I just think it's important to remain grounded in that fact when it comes to acquiring said plastic horses and then it's a little bit more niche but there's also I think there's also a lot of entitlement sometimes in the showing side of horses and you know similarly I think that it's important to remember that nobody is entitled to win anything um, even if you know you are the, the most or the least experienced shower at a hall or at a show I think that there's a lot of closed-mindedness when it comes to showing both live and photo and I think that if more people walked into either physically or metaphorically walked into a show hoping to learn things from the folks that were successful and learn things from specific judges or to even learn what specific judges favor I think if more people walked into showing with an open mind and the attitude of I'm here to have a good time, appreciate plastic horses and learn, um, 
there would be less bitterness and a lot less entitlement when it comes to showing. Um, so I think it's important to stay grounded in the fact that these are literally plastic horses um, and it's not that deep and they're a hobby and they're fun and like it's it's truly not that deep. I don't really think there's another way to say it. <laughs> like we do this for fun. Keep it fun, please. <laughs> um, okay, so that is the one heavy topic in this section. And then getting on to the last question, which is more lighthearted. And this was an excellent question. Um, what advice would you give a collector just getting into the hobby? And my answer for this is actually similar to kind of my, my resolution to the entitlement issue. <laughs> and that's just to have an open mind and be willing to learn. Um, you can learn from anyone. I learn every single time I go to a model horse show and almost every single time I have a conversation with a hobbyist that I'm meeting for the first time. Um, you can learn from literally anyone. Um, and that's the attitude I take with me to work. It's the attitude I take with me to the barn. And my trainers love it. And it, it's allowed me to learn from people that know either much more or totally different things than what I know. Everybody's, everybody's knowledge base is different. And if you listen and you let people talk, you can learn so much from people. There are so many people in this hobby that have been doing this hobby for so long. And you can learn so much just by making friends and listening. And I don't think that enough people do that. Um, and I think that there's certain parts of the hobby that we'll lose if people don't start doing that. So keep an open mind, um, be willing to learn. And like, in order to do that, go to things. Sh like show up, just go to things. Even if it's, I mean, the first live show I went to, I didn't think I was gonna know a soul. I didn't know a soul. I literally did not know a single person. Um, but I, I showed up, I showed up and I talked to people and I learned and I made friends. Um, so go, go to things, go to things. As much as that's possible for you, go to things. Go to Briarfest if you can. Truly go to Briarfest if you can. That's a big one, I guess. But go to swap meets, go to live shows if you can, attend uh, virtual events and workshops and seminars and watch the virtual events that Briar puts on and just try to be open-minded and learn. Um, when it comes to collecting, my advice would be to collect what you like. Definitely collect what you like. I think it's easy for people to get caught up in like what's popular and what's new and if you do that, uh, you know, you might always like what's popular and new and that's fine. But if you collect things solely because they're popular and new, you're eventually not gonna like them. So just collect what you like. There's so much out there that you can collect. I, I love OF Briar. I've always loved OF Briar. I think that resins are incredible and I think that we've got some amazing artists in this hobby and I will always be supportive of that in whatever capacity I can. It's just not something that I collect right now or you know maybe ever will and that's okay people can like different things um but collect what you like find what you like experiment a little bit figure out kind of what your style and what your tastes are and then collect what you like um, because again this is plastic horses like you're, you're doing this because you like plastic horses so you should collect the plastic horses that you like and not what everybody else likes just because everybody else likes it that was the last question. I have been talking for so long. <laughs> My voice hurts. Hopefully I haven't driven you too crazy yet or made you hate me because of some hot takes, but um, that was my first Q&A video. I like truly still cannot believe how many questions I got from people. A lot of these were duplicates um, and I just kind of had to winnow it down to a list that wouldn't leave us here for three hours. So anyways, we're still here for a long time, but hopefully not too long. And I hope you guys enjoyed me answering all of your questions. I think I'm going to try to do like one of these a year, kind of like my other YouTube videos, um, because this was fun. And I feel like there were a lot of questions that people didn't ask that I expected them to ask and kind of vice versa. 
So I'm sure if I was to put out a poll tomorrow, I would get a whole different set of questions. So I hope you enjoyed the first video in the new horse corner. Um, I don't know, no idea what my next video is going to be. Oh, there's like a very, very, very slight chance that I will be going to Briar West. So maybe there would be an experience video from that. I don't know though, you didn't hear that from me. Uh, I hope you guys all have a lovely evening and I hope you enjoyed. And ask me more questions and I'll throw them on the list for next time.